So I'm just going to start with this. We started the uh, strategic water uh, trail plan mainly as an outgrowth of, of our water trail sponsorship for the Schuylkill. Uh, many of you know we run the Schuylkill River Sojourn every year, which is a seven-day paddle, and we see a lot of potential for establishing a water trail that's a bit more than what it is now. What it is presently is about 45 launches and landings and a lot of signs. We don't have a whole lot of guidance. Our mapping is uh, 10 years old. And, and so we needed to step back for a minute and say, okay, now how do we improve this, this water trail experience? Uh, this setup's a little bit tricky, so if I overshoot the slides, that's going to be what happens. Uh, okay, uh, most of you are familiar with the school, so I'm not going to dwell on this very much. But the, uh, the, the one that we dwell on a lot is the, the first Pennsylvania Scenic River. The school call, we have a lot to be proud of here with the environmental revolution that's taking place on the school call. And part of my job is to promote that so that people don't always think of the Schuylkill as where the water got flushed to. We all work with this perception. I work with it a lot as, as well as many people here. And, and so recreation on the river can be kind of viewed as a, you've got to be kidding me by some people that uh, remember the days of Schuylkill Punch. And then the, 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 the other part of it is, is we're always out there. We always got to bring this message. So you're all familiar with this, the home of three revolutions, uh, American Industrial Environmental. And it's still quite heavily, and as you know, down, down by Boathouse Rail, it's heavily used for boating, fishing, rowing, birding, and so forth. We're trying to bring that kind of activity level further up the river. Well, wrong way. I told you I could have problem. Okay, if you have a water trail, you have to have people that are on the river. And so uh, we first uh, did a, started a bunch of survey work, uh, a very extensive survey work, to find out who was on the river and what were they doing. And this is what we came up with. Um, the sojourn, I've mentioned, canoe clubs, uh, rowers from Boathouse Row, all the way down to individuals, families, outfitters, and what we found is they were mostly male, and a few years is under the age of 16. Now I have more survey results here that I just want to kind of lay out to you on this page. The female population is 34%. Now I don't know how this 94 doesn't add up to 100, but this is how the survey worked. Uh, nearly 80% of the paddlers are 50, 50 years or older. So this, yeah, we have two right here, that are, <laughs> three that are 50 years old. So, so you know, this is kind of a, it's an odd demographic. Here I'm trying to promote the water trail, but the people that are actually using it are, are, are 50 and older. So families, young families, children, couples, they're not really the ones out. Uh, how, you know, how do we change that? And that's part of what the strategic plan is supposed to do. Uh, familiarity. 60% uh, of the respondents reported using the Schuylkill for recreation at least once a month. So we have a very dedicated source, a very core group that are out there on the river all the time. Uh, activities uh, around the river, we asked for what is recreation around the river, and uh, walking and hiking, of course, on the Schuylkill River Trail is very popular, and we do have some brochures for that over here. And then 25% of the paddlers reported actually liking to fish on the river as well. So it's not just one use, it's multiple uses. Um, kayaks are the most popular form, that's 90% now. It uh, wasn't always the case. We still remember Grumman canoes and aluminum canoes back in those days. The uh, experience level, uh, over half the people say that they're, they're pretty good. We have uh, a very small population that say we're really beginners because they move up to intermediate very quickly. The difference between the intermediate and experience, though, is, is far greater. We don't have a lot of fast water on this river. But we don't have any class three rapids. We barely have some class two. So if you want to learn how to, to kayak and paddle, this is the perfect river for you. Uh, nearly 80% of the survey paddlers reported paddling on the Schuylkill with friends. So it's a very collective uh, social activity. Not many loners out there. One out of five is going out on their own. Everybody else is part of a club, part of a group, taking a family out. So that's kind of the demographic that we have. Um, and then, well, and the one that's important to me as a heritage area is 90% of survey paddlers support local businesses. So after their paddle, they're stopping off, they're having a beer, they're going to a restaurant, they're enjoying the area, the heritage area. And part of what a heritage area does is promote the, uh, the region for the economic benefit of its community. So to us, that's a very important statistic. Uh, I'm moving along here as I set the table. 
Uh, why a strategic plan? I think I've gone through this. Uh, coincidentally, about five years ago, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission also did a, a plan about how to improve access on the river. And then they designated uh, five, five key watersheds that should be first in line for an access plan to get down to the level of where should launches be and, and what, should, what should be done to improve the, the access to the river. The Schuylkill was uh, the second or third highly rated because it was ranked on permits. A lot of people in this area have boats, and so that feeds into the statistics of the Schuylkill. Even though they may be taking their boats to the Chesapeake, it still works to our benefit. So we're, we're one of the highlighted uh, uh, watersheds for this. So as part of this effort of the strategic plan, we swept that in as well. So we'll be the first access plan in the state. Uh, that will have to accomplish that goal for the, for the fish and boat. And that's going to happen in this, this access plan. Uh, there is a, a little thing right here, a little takeaway for you, uh, as well as some other brochures. This is a, the executive summary of the uh, strategic plan. Gives you an idea of what we're looking to do. Uh, and then the communications issues were, were brought out uh, as part of the survey. And those communications issues we're also in, involving the mapping. I just mentioned that 2004 was the, uh, the last time we mapped it. The surveys came back that said well-marked river locations was a high priority. Portable toilets and restrooms, that was a very high priority for people. It's, it's nice to get in on the river, but when you got to go, you got to go. And, and the ability to get trails and towns along the water trail uh, from boat landing. So it's how to get to the access points. Now, the one thing that we, I'd like to, to talk about very briefly is the uh, other, other things that came in was other than the signage was an up-to-date water trail map. And uh, Brian Swisher from the Keystone Canoe Club here has been working very diligently on a new map. And if you have the time, uh, find the Keystone Canoe Club uh, stand downstairs. They are a sponsor. And he can show you the map and show you what they're doing uh, and, as well as uh, give you an idea, I mean, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece. It's being uh, modeled after the ones done for the Susquehanna, but it's being taken a step further to include other features that you're seeing as you go down the river. It's not just navigation, it's about the story of the school. Where are we now? Uh, okay, uh, the inventory of the, we're, we're, we're finishing up on the plan right now. We've got our, the, the first or second draft that I've, I've been looking at. The, the inventory of launches is completed. We have some 45, 47. The access gap analysis is completed. We, we try to have, we're, we're very wealthy with launches here. When we first talked to the Fish and Boat Commission, they said, you've got 45 launches. Nobody has this number. Why do you need more? You have more than anybody else ever has. Well, we're the, you know, the most densely populated area in the state, so that's why. But the, the uh, but you, to me, you can always have a little bit more. It depends on the, on the constituency you're serving. While we have these launches, some are devoted to scholars only. Some are devoted to, to various clubs. So that it's kind of a, yeah, they're there, but they're not always there. Some are private. So it's a, so it's a question of public access to public launches. The uh, launch criteria that we developed was kind of a good, better, best criteria. Okay, if this is what your launch looks like and you want to improve it, these are other things to consider. Uh, things such as closer parking areas, restrooms, always a popular item, uh, water facilities, uh, and, and access. So uh, we do have a little bit of make or break criteria just to give you what you're looking for to launch. Uh, what are trail management organizations to find? And this is kind of important. Is it's nice, nice to have a study, but if it isn't being used, it's it was. It was, uh, you know, the, the question, the effort was questionable. So when uh, dealing with the water trail management, we're looking at creating reach committees, and we're looking at volunteers to help with those committees. And we're looking at a structure that would feed to a steering committee that I would help with, and this would, we would break out with some communication, and we can identify the projects that we need to do. We can't always be out there taking strainers out of the river, but we could get a website identifying where these strainers are and give alerts and up-to-date information to people that are looking to come out on the river. So we, we are really looking at uh, in, uh, having some sort of an organization defined and, and started this year. Uh, have a VISTA recruit from AmeriCorps, that's one of those tasks. So if you have an interest for that, you know, please see me, give me a card, whatever, and, and uh, we'll get back to you on that. Uh, new navigation mapping, I, that was mentioned, and um, trail user business decals. And this is something that came out of our land trail work. This is a, uh, 
a decal we developed is actually fluorescent. So you can see it from across the street. And what that does is identifies people that are coming into town, where am I welcome to, to have my sandwich, get a hot dog, uh, grab a beer, you know, get some ice cream. And if you have this decal, a business will have that decal out there and you're, you're welcome to come in, even though you might have muddy feet, uh, you know, you've been sweaty on the river, come on in, enjoy our business. And so this is to kind of get over the, do I walk into this one or not, will I feel welcome or not? Because a lot of people are coming into towns they don't know. This is it is the icebreaker for that. Uh, I had mentioned what the criteria is for launches. I kept this in from another another uh, PowerPoint just to show you, you know, access, zoning, site acreage, maintenance capacity. A lot of problems we have with private launches. They, without a government backing, they're not always out there picking up, up, picking up trash or making sure that it's well maintained. Uh, water quality, it, uh, water conditions, overall slope to the thing, the river's edge, if there are the wetlands or historic resources to avoid. Uh, species of concern, you know, rare, rare and endangered species, you can't put a launch on top of those things. So these are all, this is kind of make or break. If you say yes to any of these, you, you have an issue. So you have to be very careful uh, when locating new launches. So this was something that we had to, had to work with. The next steps uh, that we have, and, and I'm, I'm summing up here, is to uh, complete and adopt the strategic plan. The, the plan will be adopted by our board. Uh, uh, when, it's, when it's finally uh, completed. Develop one river sign navigation system. This was one of the things that constantly is coming up. This is something that we, this doesn't even exist in the, in the Park Service handbook. Uh, what they have is, a, is, a, is an inner tube. But uh, working with the, we're not gonna have, we're not promoting tubing in the river necessarily, we're promoting watercraft. So we did a slight alteration. I've already got that sign bought and we're going to put it out to, put it out here in Potsdam when the water, water comes down and see how it does. Uh, but there's that kind of navigation aids that on the river that we're looking at installing. Implement recommendations to coordinate with land and water trails. That was that uh, We Are Welcome Trail Users thing that you saw. It's also dealing with websites, making sure the access points into in the towns and then working with the towns and getting them linked to those access points. Uh, pursue funding sources for new maps, website alerts. I mean, these are all the kind of preliminary tasks and recommendations coming out of the plan. And then uh, increase water trail diversity. And with, with that, I'm kind of winding down here. Yeah, I wound down. And on these increasing water trail diversity, uh, we have time at the end for questions. So we're just kind of, kind of rip through this because we only have the hour. And uh, we'll be able to take it from there. But uh, uh, Sophie, who will be coming up next, will be kind of addressing uh, what she was able to do to, to help with that increase uh, of in, in, uh, water trail users. And as an agency, um, the Park Service has identified youth engagement as one of our strategic priorities. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about one example of our work to engage more youth with the help of many partner organizations on the Schuylkill River. Um, so I want to take a moment to reflect um, a little bit more on some of the survey results that Bob presented to us um, earlier. So I think they certainly elucidate who our typical Schuylkill River paddler is, right? Um, they're old, 80% older than 50 years and under 5%. <laughs> I thought I might get some. <laughs> Fewer than 5% were younger than 26. They're also very familiar with the resource. Um, on average, uh, the surveyed paddlers have been using the Schuylkill River for recreation for 17 years. Um, they're also very experienced paddlers. 90% consider themselves to be at least intermediate, if not experienced or expert paddlers. Um, so now the question is, who is missing in this equation? And it's these guys, right? It's the youth who have no paddling experience who have to start with learning how to hold their paddle. Um, and while this can be frustrating to get results back like this over and over again, where we see our user base um, for a natural resource or a recreational resource not really reflecting necessarily accurately the population that lives near the resource, um, I think more 
More than frustrating, it presents an amazing opportunity for us to really start prioritizing engaging more youth on the river. Um, so we have this opportunity, right, to begin to grow our user base um, by including more young people um, that will help sustain the water trail into the future. We have this opportunity to encourage river stewardship by providing opportunities for um, youth to really to recreate on the river and reconnect with their water source. Um, and we have this opportunity to start reversing some of the trends and the history of disconnect and exclusion. So how do we start? How do we do this? Um, I think one place we usually look to is gateway experiences. And the idea is to provide some sort of experience that's safe, accessible, fun, and meaningful for youth to really connect with the river maybe for the first time in their lives. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about one successful model um, of a gateway paddling experience that we implemented last fall of 2013, and that's the canoe mobile. And the canoe mobile is exactly as it sounds. It's a trailer with six large Voyager canoes attached to it, um, and it travels the country. Um, it travels the country every year. Last year, it stopped in 19 cities. Um, Wilderness Inquiry is the founder of the Canoe Mobile, and they're an organization based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And their mission really is to get as many youth as possible in urban areas out recreating on their rivers. And so um, some key points that I want to bring up about the Canoe Mobile that makes it really unique um, is that the Canoe Mobile literally meets people where they are, right? They bring this trailer of canoes to the populations that are underserved. Um, and they've gone to New York City, they've gone to Washington, D.C. Um, and last year we were able to bring them to Philadelphia, Camden, Wilmington, and Chester. Um, something else that's unique about the Canoe Mobile is that they use these huge Voyager canoes, um, which are 350 pounds and are incredibly stable. So in their 30 years of experience, they've never had a canoe tip. Um, except on purpose. And something else unique is that they fit 10 people each. So they can have a trained, a highly trained boat captain in each canoe, and as well as nine participants. So while the students are learning to paddle, they're also building a sense of teamwork. Um, and one more thing is that their program is very flexible and can be modified to really fit any sort of access site, any sort of location, any sort of schedule. Um, and so, as I mentioned, last year we were able, um, through some funding that we had, as well as some funding from the U.S. Forest Service Urban Field Station in Philadelphia, we were able to bring the canoe mobile to three states, four mm -hmm. cities, um, and three different rivers including the Christina River in Wilmington, the Delaware River in Camden and Chester, and the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. So I'm going to be talking mostly about our program in Philadelphia. Um, and so we launched the boats from the St. Joe's Rowing Center. There's a public dock there. Um, that's an amazing dock. It's really long. It was perfect for this sort of event. Um, and we recruited about 150 students for this event, this one-day event, um, from local charter schools and public schools. And it was really crucial for us to have a great partner organization to help us recruit students. Um, and we worked very closely with Fairmount Waterworks um, because they have amazingly strong and long-standing relationships with the local schools. Um, so they really helped advocate for us within the school district, um, among principals, for us to um, have this event. Because, you know, water is really scary for a lot of people. Um, and when you put kids near water, it's even worse. Um, and basically how the day went was that 
we had two three-hour sessions um, where we engaged 75 students per session. Um, and we divided each session into two parts. So there was um, a paddling component of each session and also land-based programming. And this is also something really crucial about the canoe mobile. The reason why they're able to engage so many students um, is because they partner with local organizations to run land-based programming. So in our case, we partnered with Fairmount Waterworks and also with the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. Um, and by doing that, we were able to have rotations. So we would put half of the kids out on the water and half of the kids in land-based programming and then do rotation. So now we get to see some pictures. Um, basically, the next set of pictures will just sort of run you through how a day would look. Um, so the students would arrive, we would divide them into those two groups. Half of them would start setting up to go out on the river. Um, and so the very first thing that the Wilderness Inquiry boat captain, captains did um, was fit all of the participants in PFDs um, and also gave them a paddle. Then there was a large group safety talk. Um, and this took about 20 to 30 minutes, and the idea was to get the kids to feel more comfortable with going out on the water, and also to make them feel like they had a sense of trust with the boat captains. Um, and this is really crucial because a lot of the kids come there literally shaking. Um, they've never had an, an experience in a boat on the Schuylkill River, <laughs> um, let alone at all. And so this part was really crucial. Um, next, the kids were divided into small canoe groups. Um, and each boat captain, the boat captains are in those bright yellow hats, um, really taught them how to paddle, taught them how to hold their paddle. Um, and also started to build a sense of teamwork among each group. Then we loaded up the boats. And the next slide shows you, you know, this is how a lot of the kids feel. They're terrified. And so it's crucial that the boat captain has the ability and knows what kind of language to use to help calm each student down. And this is something Wilderness Inquiry is fabulous at doing. They always start by paddling upstream, so, so the way back isn't horrible. <laughs> um, and so meanwhile, while those students were out on the water, we had Fairmount Waterworks um, running some land-based programming around water quality. Um, so here you can see they're capturing some water samples. And we also had uh, the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education do a game around the water cycle. And then the kids return um, with the current and hopefully with a smile. And they always end the day with a reflection. So the students can really talk about what they saw, what they learned, um, what their experience was like, what sort of fears they might have conquered. Um, I think this is also a really crucial part of the canoe mobile model. And then their two rotations switch. So, we couldn't have done this without our amazing partner organizations. Um, here is a list of just our partners from the Philadelphia event. But overall, over the course of four days, we worked with the, over 35 partners, which was a lot. <laughs> and um, I mean, I could go into more detail about all of the planning efforts, but you know, it included everything from applying for permits from the Coast Guard to applying for park permits, to getting a marine unit out on the water with us, um, because whenever you have an event like this, um, they require that they have a safety boat out. Um, so there are a lot of logistics that went into this. Um, and thankfully, we had amazing partners help. And so the results. Um, I love this. I love this set of pictures, right? <laughs> You see this really scared face, and then look how much confidence she has as she comes back to shore. Um, so over the course of four days, we engaged 440 students, um, 60 school staff and chaperones. So that's about 500 people that we got in boats. 
um, and 35 partner organizations. So why does this model work? Well, I think there are three key things, accessibility, flexibility, and trust. Um, so Wilderness Inquiry makes their program extremely accessible. Anyone can paddle in these boats. They don't really have an age constraint. Um, we engaged kids that were eight and we engaged kids that were 18 in the same day. Um, there was no swimming experience necessary and students could wear their normal clothes. They didn't need any special gear. So really, literally anyone could um, could participate. The Wilderness Inquiry is also very flexible, as I mentioned before with their programming. They can really adapt to any sort of environment. Um, we had many late buses and they were able to shorten their program and still um, have an amazing experience for the students. And we also had partners who were able to adapt on the fly, which was very crucial. Um, and lastly, and probably most importantly, is that Wilderness Inquiry is really amazing at building a sense of trust, not only um, among the students, or between the boat captains and the students, but also between their organization and other organizations, right? Because it takes a lot of, a lot of advocating, a lot of convincing um, to get school administrators, to get mayors, um, to get city officials on board for this sort of event. And because they have a really amazing reputation of 30 years of experience and having never tipped a boat, um, we were able to make that case and to make this event happen. I should also mention that the sense of trust between our local community organizations and the schools, um, that relationship was very crucial for this event as well. So this is um, the pyramid of engagement. Um, it's a model that Wilderness Inquiry has put together. And it really just shows you where these gateway experiences can lead. So every year they might um, introduce 10,000 youth to an outdoor experience, right? And then maybe 1,000 of those youth will go on to have a little bit deeper of an experience. And then 500 of those will have, will go on a longer um, outdoor excursion. And then eventually you get to the top of the period, pyramid um, where you have at least 100 of those 10,000 youth engaged in a career um, in the outdoors. And so obviously this is a long-term model, um, but I think it's really relevant, um, especially in this conversation about whether gateway experiences are um, successful and um, whether or not we should invest our time in sort of one-off experiences. And that's the end. Park Service um, has a community assistance program. So in addition to all the national parks that are out there, uh, we really feel it's important for us to try to engage with the community and support community-based efforts for conservation and recreation. And so uh, this Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program is one that I manage for the Northeast region. We have about 15 staff and about eight field offices scattered all throughout the 13 states of the Northeast. And uh, so the Park Service has a strategic plan that uh, kind of gives us some directions for where we should be focusing our efforts in the next few years. And one of the, as Sophie mentioned, one of the, our strategic goals is youth engagement and get, getting youth more outdoors. And another one of the goals is uh, water trails and increasing access to, to rivers and waterways and getting more people involved. And so what I'm going to talk with you about today is just some of the efforts that are going on at the state and federal level that are trying to support the work that's happening on the Schuylkill River. And so uh, I'm first going to put on my, my state level hat um, where I'm part of a partnership called the Pennsylvania Water Trails Partnership. And we've been working for the last few years on trying to develop support for Pennsylvania's water trail system. And so these are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, what, what some of the goals of our partnership are, who are the partners in the, in the partnership, what the, what the network looks like. And it's really incredible. You know, I think all of us are aware that over the last 10, 15 years, there's really been an explosion of interest in paddling. Um, 
you go everywhere in the summertime and you just see all these cars with, with uh, boats on them. And you know, that's just a huge change. And, um, and so it's led to a lot of interest in people trying to have safe experiences on the rivers. And so what we're trying to do is identify ways that we can support those kind of efforts. And so this water trail partnership is trying to look at ways that we can do that across the state, you know, and across the country. So I'll also be going, uh, talking on a little bit later about uh, a new effort that's happening at the federal level, something called the National Water Trail System. And the whole, I, I guess the whole water trail uh, program in Pennsylvania has kind of matured over the last 10 years or so. I, I guess the, the very first water trail in Pennsylvania um, that I was most aware of was, uh, it took place um, on the middle branch of the Susquehanna River. Uh, it was close to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, there had been recently uh, an executive order in Pennsylvania that came out the, from the governor uh, clarifying the policy as who, who, who owns the islands in the, uh, across the state. Um, and for those islands where there was no uh, clear deed or title, those, the ownership reverted to uh, DCNR. And so if you know the Susquehanna, there's this wonderful constellation of islands. I, I don't know the numbers, but it's 50 or more um, just scattered throughout. It's a wonderful landscape. And uh, so folks started looking at that and say, whoa, this is incredible we could do really something cool with these islands and put, and so what they did was they established this network of primitive campsites um, on those islands. Uh, and so this, this was work that was done by the Susquehanna River Trail Association, SRTA. And so they were really kind of the first in the state to look at a resource, identify ways of improving public access. So in addition to the, you know, establishing the campsites, they also put together a series of water trail map and guides. So, because you got to know where to go, where to get on, and all that good stuff. And so they really kind of launched the whole water trail movement in Pennsylvania. And since then, um, uh, there's been a, an explosion of interest in, in rivers joining this network around the state. So briefly, the partnership is made up of uh, a real interesting uh, kind of mix of both state and federal and private partners. And each of them has something to contribute to the mix, like a good partnership. So the Fish and Boat Commission is interested in water trails, mainly through a, a boating safety lens. You know, they've been really concerned that over the last several years that um, there's been a lot of fatalities um, uh, on, on rivers. Uh, and, and I guess what they're finding is that actually the number of motorized fatalities is going down, but the non-motorized is going up. And, you know, I guess if there's more people out on the river, you know, you're going to have that. And what they're finding is that, you know, there's knuckleheads that are out there in um, 50 to, you know, really cold temperatures without any efficient, without any PFDs, you know, and they, they maybe they're drinking a little bit. And so that's, that's one subset. And, but so they're trying to use water trails as a way of communicating you know, boat, better boating safety kind of uh, messages and, and, and trying to reach out to the less experienced kind of. And so they really saw water trails as a way of engaging that kind of audience. So that's their filter. Pennsylvania DCNR, you know, that conservation, the statewide conservation and recreation folks, you know, and they're interested in, you know, kind of improving public ask, access to rivers uh, and also providing good information. So the Park Service, you know, me as my uh, Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program, kind of looking at the whole state uh, and promoting water trails. And um, there's also, uh, uh, the Park Service is a major uh, participant in uh, the restoration efforts on the Chesapeake Bay. And so there's something called the Chesapeake Bay Gateways and Water Trails Network. And they have, well, I should mention that both DCNR and uh, this Chesapeake Bay program, they, they had money. Um, and so DCNR has been putting money towards public access site development, and just Big Bay Gateways Network has been putting money towards water trail map and guides. Basically, how do we improve access through information and through physical facilities? And then the Pennsylvania Environmental Council has been the nonprofit partner, and so they've been out, they've been also one of the technical assistance providers 
as well as uh, these other folks. And so we've, we've been coming together over the last several years and, and looking at ways that we can try to promote uh, water trails around the state. And so see, these are some of the goals uh, that have been developed. You know, try to do it in a sustainable way, as I said, improving access, looking for those connections to land trails like here on the Schuylkill River. Um, the uh, SCORP uh, is one of those government, good government acronyms, means statewide Com comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. And uh, th this is uh, related to something called the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund, which I'm not sure if anybody, uh, how familiar folks are with that, but this is the, the, pri the probably the primary federal resource for promoting conservation and recreation. There's probably been you know, a billion dollars invested in um, facility development and land acquisition through the Land and Water Conservation Fund um, over the last, it's, I guess the program has been around since 68, and during the Carter administration they had a bazillion dollars. But, um, so, so every state has to do a comprehensive plan, basically, for how they're going to use those federal dollars. Pennsylvania gets about a million dollars a year, I think, through that program. Big, big chunk of money, you know. Not, um, and so this, the, the most recent SCORP said, yeah, water trails, uh, improving public access is a, an important goal, and that's something we want to try to promote. And then um, there's, I guess, an evolving set of national re uh, recognition and designations for water trails. And uh, so one is, uh, have folks heard of the national trail system, the Appalachian Trail, national, a Appalachian National Scenic Trail? Um, so there's like three categories of trails that are recognized in the national trail system. National Scenic, National Historic, and uh, there's a Captain John Smith National Historic Water Trail that was designated a few years back. And that's um, to try to promote uh, telling the ca Captain John Smith story, who was you know, the, one of the original pioneer guys that uh, you know, kind of paddled around the Chesapeake Bay and try to use that as a tool to increase uh, people's excitement about uh, stewardship and protection of the Chesapeake Bay. And then finally, so, so there's National Scenic, National Historic, and National Recreation Trails. And National Recreation Trails are a recognition program that the Secretary of Interior has. And it's basically to recognize outstanding, I sort of call it the Academy Awards of, of trails. You know, how many? <laughs> How often can you get uh, you know, a, a recognition from the Secretary of Interior that your trail is something special? Well, the Schuylkill River, both the land trail, various sections of the land trail, and the water trail have been recognized as a national recreation trail, one of the great trails of the country. So that's one of the next, but there's a new kind of uh, national designation that um, we'll touch on a little bit later. So there's really been, uh, over the last, uh, what we, right, this is year 2014, so yeah, almost 15 years there's been this explosion of interest around the state in uh, water trails. And so uh, I guess the Fish and Boat Commission for a while was kind of formally designating, until the partnership kind of took over the role, kind of formally designating, designating water trails. And so you can see that a lot of the major navigable, paddleable rivers around the state have been recognized. There's like 2,000 miles of water trails in the state that are part of this program now. And so including good old, I guess, even going up into the headwaters, right, Bob? Uh, it, the, the water flow is a real issue uh, most times of the year to get up that far. Right. You said Schuylkill Haven, I guess. Is Schuylkill sort of Haven is uh, the recognized start. Although, if you have good water, you can get up to Pottsville. Okay. So we already talked about the goals. So, so that's there's like 25 of them. That's amazing. Uh, and they so what what's happening now is that going it, it's kind of evolving from the big rivers to now sort of the next generation of rivers, sort of the the smaller guys. Not to downplay. Oh, obviously Ohio's not small, but um, this is downstream of, the, of Pittsburgh. Uh, so it's still, you know, well, no, it's, it's pretty big there. So, but, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you can see the Shenango, um, French Creek. I'm not sure uh, other rivers farther to the east. Obviously, those are out west. Oh, yeah, and uh, 
Yeah, so this, uh, uh, the, uh, obviously this is mainly a river base, just given the geography of Pennsylvania, but uh, I guess the Presque Isle Water Trail is looking up at, you know, on the, the Lake Erie sort of area there. So that's, uh, so we've tried that kind of, I kind of lay out um, with some help from, I guess there was an organization at one point. At one point there was a national advocacy organization for water trails. Uh, the acronym was NOT and uh, N-A-W-T, not N-O-T. <laughs> They don't exist anymore, unfortunately. They're not around. Uh, <laughs> our, our <laughs> North American water trails. And, and so one of the things that they had put together at one point was a set of principles that good water trails should follow. And so um, partnerships, yeah, obviously we, we always have to kind of work together on this. Uh, there's, there needs to be some sort of strategy for stewardship, for taking care of this stuff. We need to, we need to engage volunteers. We want to use water trails. And, and one of the real critical things with water trails is that, um, and why the Chesapeake Bay program is so interested in water trails, is that um, the Bay program restoration efforts for a long time were really, really focused on just kind of scientific. So they were really focused on um, sort of the technical aspects of restor restoration, but they kind of lost sight of the people side of it. And so the reason they brought in the Park Service was some of our ex expertise in interpretation and education, kind of the storytelling piece and the engagement piece. And so what we what what we're trying to do is we realize that if we can get people out on the resource, engaged in the resource, using it, then we're going to get more excitement from them and greater involvement. And that's going to be a much more powerful tool for kind of building a constituency for restoration. And so we've been trying to apply that same concept for water trails here in Pennsylvania. So that's why the stewardship and volunteer and education pieces are so really critically important. Obviously, uh, you know, as Bob and Sophie have been saying, you know, we want to go beyond the current constituency and look for ways of kind of broadening that, the diversity of users on these water trails. And so some of the ways that uh, the partnership has been trying to support this work is through technical assistance. You know, what are, the sp what are the specific ways of putting together map and guides? Brian, I worked on all the Susquehanna water trail map and guides, so I'd be really happy to work with you on, because uh, I think that the kind of approach that you're taking with the map and guide is spot on. It's awesome stuff. So networking, you know, looking for opportunities to kind of spread the message like today. Um, but we're kind of seeing that uh, w w there needs, now that the system is kind of maturing, we want to do more to uh, kind of get the word out. You know, how can we get more people aware of this resource and how can we put information in their hands to get them out and having safe experiences? And, you know, it, and, and kind of encouraging these kind of designations um, at the state and federal level. So, uh, so this is, it. so for new water trails, um, this is kind of the designation process. I, I think I'm going to skip over that. One thing I'm going to note is that um, one of the things that we were able to work out through, uh, there's, I guess there's, uh, in Harrisburg, there's a legislative budget and finance committee. And so apparently one of the things they do is economic impact studies. And so uh, the partnership was able, able to, I guess it took a resolution uh, by the state legislature to do a study. Uh, so what are the, you know, what's the benefit of these water trails in Pennsylvania? So uh, they, they, last year, two years ago, they looked at four rivers around the state and they tried to kind of pick a diversity of different types of rivers. Um, and so, uh, probably look at, hey, these, these kind of demographics look pretty similar. What they did was they, they uh, took volunteers out to specific launch sites and actually talked with folks that were putting on on the river over those periods of time. I think it's very, you know, very consistent kind of constituency. Interesting. And so, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, from a dollar standpoint, the numbers were a little bit underwhelming, you know. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe it's just due to the limited sampling 
I don't know that uh, the study, you know, I think, Bob, you actually looked at the study. They didn't try to extrapolate in any way. They just said, here it is. I think the 731 is the extrapolation. So <laughs> not just the Four Rivers, but I think that was the, the statewide annual number. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's more than just the four, really? Yeah. I, I, I remember that. I Did think you? it was the, you know, the bottom line is what's the economic benefit of I, Yeah. Sales. So I'm not sure I agree with that. But yeah, state. I'm not sure I agree with that. And they've also uh, recently done, um, so what the partnership has been trialing, primarily fi trying to do is to kind of focus on interacting with the managers, all these different, you know, sort of the lead organization for all these water trails and trying to find out what their needs are. And so here's some of the, the needs that they've identified. You know, we want to know what's, what's really the best way of going about, you know, working on these water trails. Uh, you know, this is something that, Bob, you've been harping on, is we need some better guidance at the state level on what signs should, what, how the signs should look and what the content should be. And so hopefully uh, the partnership will do more efforts on that, um, doing a better job of uh, identifying, you know, potential funding sources, uh, doing more on, partner, on marketing and training, and uh, kind of working with uh, businesses on economic development opportunities. You know, can we help? foster guides and, and uh, things like that. So I probably killed my time, right? We have 10 minutes left for questions if you I did want to talk for two minutes on the uh, National Water Trail System, and it means tripping over cords again. Here. So um, how many of you have heard of um, or could name, this is a, t this is a trivia test. <laughs> the Obama administration back in 2009 or 10 came out with its branded National Conservation and Recreation Initiative. And what was that called? <laughs> yes, it was called the America's Great Outdoors Initiative. And it was intended to be kind of their their agenda for conservation and recreation in the country. And one of the things that this AGO report called for was a national water trail system, kind of recognizing all the great efforts that are taking place around the states with water trails. And so I want to talk really briefly about this national water trail system and uh, the opportunity that it presents for the Schuylkill River. So I want to do this in two minutes so we don't kill our, con our discussion time. So um, I guess the, the key thing, you know, it, it's, it's a recognition program and there might be some money with it, it it's, but it's mainly recognition. So it kind of builds on this national recreation trail uh, process that I mentioned earlier that the Schuylkill River has uh, undertaken, but it adds a new twist, which is it sets out a set of best management practices. And so the, the designation process, which I'll, um, so you have to apply to the Secretary of Interior, sort of like uh, a National Recreation Trail. Um, so these are the criteria that you have to use. It has to be open, whatever that means for water trails. <laughs> um, it's got to be supported. That, that, it, yeah, so there's supposed to be some sort of indication from uh, access site owners that they support this kind of recognition. Uh, similar kind of best management practices as, as those principles are that I mentioned earlier. And so what we've been working with, uh, with the Schuylkill uh, Heritage Area and partners on this strategic plan, and what we're trying to do through that strategic plan is kind of set that that group up so that if you wanted to pursue the National Water Trail designation that uh, you'd be kind of laying out, so both documenting and laying out um, sort of the, how you would try to address these best management practices. And so uh, there's an online form that you submit and kind of document, again, how you kind of address those best management practices. Uh, these are some of the benefits uh, opportunity to get some funding. This, they're still trying to, trying to sort, sort out funding opportunities, mainly national recognition and promotion. 
Um, and so there's an, been a number of uh, water trails around the country that have achieved this recognition. This is a little bit out of date, so there's been a, several more that have been added. A lot of big river systems you can see here. So the Schuylkill, you know, definitely fits as, I, I think, is one of these great water trails in the country. So there's more information, and I think I'll just stop there, and maybe, maybe Sophie and Bob should come up, and we could. Are there any questions? Yeah, and let's we'll just see what questions. questions folks have. Yeah, I have a question. In the Kijiji plan, I didn't see anything regarding infrastructure. Uh, and by infrastructure, I mean like uh, we're getting people out on the rivers, but there's there are dams on our rivers, and you've got to get around the dam. Hmm. And uh, that's something in our section, down in Phoenixville, we've been concerned about it for, for a long time. We'd like to put a, uh, have a portage put in around Black Rock Dam. Mm -hmm. So what, what's being addressed with regarding issues like that? Video guy? Sure, I should be here. Sure. Do you want us to hold on to a microphone? That's up to you. Well, uh, uh, Paul, on that particular one, a portage identification, it, you know, plan was was uh, prepared by uh, SJC about eight and ten years ago. What happened in that particular area of Black Rock was uh, the, the funds were limited. There was no design work uh, that the county was going to undertake for that, and and so that. Um, the, the upshot of it all was is you needed partnership with the property owner. You needed funding and you needed design work. It's a construction of, a, of any other nature, which at the end of the day has to limit liability and produce the desired effect. That didn't happen there at Black Rock. And when you're undertaking each one of these things, all of a sudden you realize you're into a much bigger project than just clearing some trees out and putting a slope in. There's GP2 permits, there's, there's design work, there's, like I said, the liability issues, and then there's the maintenance of it. And unless you have property owners along the, the dams that are going to take that on, it's always going to be ad hoc. And that's the case at, at Black Rock and, and many of the others. They're ad hoc. Uh, none of these that I'm aware of have been designed out. Would I like them to be? Yes. But we need the funding, we need them identified, we need to recreate these partnerships to make it happen. Uh, we just can't rally re behind a good idea in, the, in these days and times. It all has to be plotted out, designed, thought out, maintained, managed, agreements in place and so forth. That's a lot more complicated than it appears. So unless somebody kicks us out, we'll just keep on uh, kind of sneaking around these dams. Do you know who owns the Cutting Street Islands right over here? Um, I think Montgomery County has part of that. Are they open to the public? I, that I do not know. One thing I don't see a lot of on the school is camping. It's well, like we, we actually discourage that. You can have a 12 inch, 8 to 12 inch rainfall mm -hmm. in Schuylkill County. Yeah, you have to watch that. And if you don't know it's there, all of a sudden you could be underwater if you're camping on an island. Mm -hmm. So we really try to discourage that because these every 6.8 years this river floods. I mean, I actually did the math and I added it all up one day. Yeah. It all floods. And, and these are, and uh, I recall there was some flash flooding. Uh, probably about five, six years ago, Schuylkill County had like an eight to 12 inch rainfall. Mm -hmm. And Schuylkill County only drains in one place. It's not a mile mm -hmm. wide like the Susquehanna. Right. So it comes up a lot yeah, here. so we really don't, and so the, the question is, is where are the camping opportunities along the Schuylkill that aren't on, on islands or you know, where there's campgrounds or things of that nature and there really aren't any. And so this right. is an area, again, I would like to see some improvement to. Uh, but there again, we, we end up with liability issues. Who's going to maintain? I mean, it all comes down to the same kind of bureaucratic nonsense. I, I can tell you, I moved in the area in 1979, so I've been waiting, fishing, boating, school kill for that period of time. And I was kind of lukewarm about waiting in the river at that point in time. It was gray, it had that fishy smell, you know, the Reading treatment plant wasn't operating very well. Uh, it was a pretty dirty river. Uh, but I was also involved with the Boy Scouts for a five-year period there, and some of the other leaders wanted to establish a trip down to Spook, and they ended up doing it twice, which I was also lukewarm about mm -hmm. when I started out. And they were wonderful trips. They really were. I mean, the water is so much cleaner now, and I can tell you, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic smallmouth bass fishery right now. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it, it's a different experience seeing the river from yeah. the river rather than from the expressway. And there's yeah. all the eagles. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a lot more rural than what you would expect it to be yeah. driving down 422. Yeah. It's a really nice experience. Oh, we have thanks. a question back there and then over here. So, uh, obviously, I, I see the benefit of getting the community involved with these water trails and everything. I was just wondering if anybody has or anybody intends to look at the effect of the increased use of these waterways on the environmental quality of the river, whether it's water quality or whether it's destroying riparian forests, put in these landings or, or anything like that, or beer cans, may it be, from the, the massive amounts of use. I, I think the, re, the, the result of more people on the river is the increase of stewardship. At least that's my hope. We have um, a tremendous problem here on the Schuylkill with plastic water bottles. I can't express this enough. When we have uh, a rain that comes through, the amount of plastic that comes out of the city of Reading down the sewers and out onto the river is, is just, uh, it's, it's a hideous amount. We have a log jam on one of our bridges and it's a constant supply of plastic water bottles. You know, the more you get people out on the river, the more the, you hope the more they care about it. Now, in terms of launches and locations, that is part of the criteria. Rain, rare and endangered species, uh, erosions, there's permitting involved. So yeah, these things are environmentally addressed, as well as the archaeology of the site. So it's all part of that, that process. There's not any study that shows increased stewardship as you increase use, or no, no plan on doing it? Not that I mean, the perception is that there's not a lot of people out there now. It's, it's underutilized resource. It really is. Yeah. Like, you know, except for like around Philadelphia, where yeah. you know, you're so close to an urban population there, you've got relatively good access, although it could be better. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a kind of constrained down at the city to, to various right. leagues and groups. I think we had a question. Yeah, over here. just a general question. The National Park Service. Your work with the waterways in the area, what percentage of your work is related to like physical projects like a portage or a stream lake restoration? And what percentage is, would you say, outreach related? I think it's more on the outreach side. Yeah. Um, I, uh, that, that program, the Chesapeake Bay Gateways program, uh, they do have a grants program. Um, I'm not sure how much they got. Uh, maybe a million or so dollars this year to sprinkle throughout the whole massive Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so one of the types of projects they, they uh, emphasize is boat access. And so they, they, they've gotten a lot of experience. In. So like if you're looking for information, that would be an awesome resource. And I could, baygateways.net is their website. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you all for, for coming. Hope you learned something today and you get out on the river. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it, it, don't forget.